Thank you so much. So my name is Heidi Klippel. And again, I am an estate planning attorney here in San Diego. And thank you guys so much for attending this presentation today. So today we're going to talk about estate planning. And for those of you that are on the presentation, uh, you should have received an email uh, with an estate planning packet about estate planning. And in that packet, it basically goes through all the different documents that we're going to talk about today, um, including trusts, wills, durable powers of attorney, and medical directives. If by chance you didn't get that packet, we can email that to you. Uh, oh, look, look how good you are, Vanya, sharing it in the chat. I'm so impressed with all your technological abilities. Uh, but again, that packet pretty much summarizes uh, the highlights of what each of these documents do. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so for those of you who have an estate plan, I just want you to know that we will talk about some recent changes in the law. So there will be some things uh, contained in this presentation that should be educational for you as well. So I'm just going to start with the basics, and that is what happens in the state of California if you don't have an estate plan? So in the state of California, if you were to die without an estate plan, you die what's called intestate. And that means that the state of California has an estate plan for you. So if you die as a married person, we are what's called a community property state, which means that the state of California would give your half of community property automatically to your surviving spouse. And if you have what's called separate property, then those assets are divisible depending upon how many children you have being divided between your spouse and your children. So separate property are assets that you owned prior to marriage, or those are also assets that you inherit after marriage or before marriage. And it's also assets that you're gifted. But for an asset to stay separate property, it has to be an asset that's in your individual name and you want to keep those assets separated from your community property. So in the state of California, once you get married, 50 cents of every dollar you make is legally your spouse's. So if I owned a house prior to marriage and then if I got married, even if I kept the title of the house in my name from the date of marriage forward, 50 cents of every dollar I make is my spouse's. So from the date of marriage on, my spouse does acquire a community property interest in that house, even though title's in my name, which just know this presentation is not about family law and community property, separate property. But I'm just trying to explain this because when you pass away, if you have separate property, let's say that I died without a will or a trust and I have two children, which I actually have, and a spouse, and let's say that I did own a house prior to marriage that, that was paid in full, so it's 100% my sole and separate property. If I didn't have a will or a trust specifying who inherits those assets, and because I have separate property, not community property, and because I have more than one child, the state of California would give that separate property asset because I have more than one child, it would give it by thirds between my spouse and my two children. Whereas if I didn't have any separate property, California intestate laws would give that asset 100% to my spouse. So it is interesting and it is important in California when you die without a will or a trust, if you have separate property that is divided differently than community property. So I do like to mention that. And I also want to mention that if you are a blended family in the state of California, California has a bias against step family members. So if my husband and I are on a second marriage, and if he has two children from his first marriage, and let's say I have two children from my first marriage, and let's say for hypothetical purposes, we have no children in common. So all we have between the two of us are our own biological children, but no children together. And if I died first without a will or a trust, California would give all of my assets to my husband as community property under the intestate statute. And then if my husband died after I did without a will or a trust, California would give all of our assets to his biological children, 100%, nothing to my biological children because they were his stepchildren because California has a bias against stepchildren. So I do wanna mention that in the state of California, if you are a blended family, 
you do want to have at a minimum a will and or a trust because in these legal documents, if you acknowledge each other's stepchildren, then you can provide for them equally like they are your biological children just by including them by name as beneficiaries in these legal documents. So that is one really important nuance as far as why have an estate plan in the state of California. And there is something in California that, that we do recognize called a holographic will. California would so rather you have a legal document than not have one. And California also recognizes that not everybody wants to go see an attorney. Sometimes it's socioeconomic. Not everybody can afford an attorney. Sometimes you might be on your deathbed and you just don't have the time or the ability to go to an attorney. So if you handwrite in your own handwriting that I, Heidi Klippel, on March 28th, give all of my assets to my spouse first and then my children second on this March 28th signed and dated Heidi Klippel. As long as that will is in my own handwriting signed by me, dated and acknowledged. And as long as I include the one magical word that I intend for this to be my will, that is a legally binding document in the state of California. So not all states recognize that type of a document. And I should preface that by saying that each state in the United States does have their own approach to estate planning. So everything we're talking about today is California specific. So in the state of California, we are one of the states that will accept a holographic will, which is a handwritten will. And as long as you handwrite it in its entirety, sign it, date it, and use the word, the magical word that you intend for it to be your will, that is a legally binding document and you don't have to have an attorney prepare it for you. So again, if you were to die without a will or a trust, you die what's called intestate, which means that the state of California has decided who will inherit your assets. So the hierarchy of distribution of beneficiaries is spouse inherits community property. And then depending on how many children you have, if you have separate property, if you have zero children, separate property goes 100% to your spouse. If you have one child, separate property is divided 50% between spouse and child. And if you have more than one child, no matter how many children you have, separate property is divisible by thirds. If you don't have separate property, then everything by default is deemed community property, in which case 100% of that goes to spouse. And then the hierarchy of distribution, again, is spouse first. And if you're not legally married, then it goes down your lineal bloodline to biological and legally adopted children, not step. And if any of your children are deceased, then a deceased child's share would go down their bloodline to their surviving legally adopted and or biological children, but not step. And if there are no living lineal descendants, we go up the bloodline to mom and dad or to surviving parent, but not step. And then we go sideways through the sibling line, which includes half siblings, but not step. And if any sibling has passed away, we go down their bloodline, nieces, nephews, great nieces, great nephews. And if there still is not a living blood relative, we go up the bloodline to grandparents or surviving grandparent. Then we go to aunts, uncles, first cousin, second cousin. And then if we can't find a biological living bloodline or blood relative, then the final heir would be the state of California, which in 23 years of practicing law, I have never seen the state of California as the final heir of an estate. But that would ultimately be who would inherit assets if there was not a biological living blood relative found. And there are companies now, by the way, that uh, can be hired. They're called air locator companies. So that um, if we don't know who those closest living biological relatives are, a lot of us attorneys will employ these different companies to go out and do these very in-depth um, air locating services to find those relatives. So that is what happens in the state of California if you don't have a will. But if you have a will, the purpose of a will is a couple of things. One is you're going to identify a person called an executor. The job of an executor is basically to pay all of your final debts because legally in the state of California, nobody can inherit your assets until all of your debts have been paid in full. Debts would include your final funeral bills, medical bills, your state and federal taxes. 
If your estate is large enough, you might have what's called federal estate taxes to pay. That is the tax that is imposed by the federal government. If your estate is large enough that you trigger the federal estate tax, the federal estate tax amount changes on an annual basis. Right now in 2024, the amount of money that each of us can leave that are U.S. residents and U.S. citizens is $13.21 million per person. Um, and again, that amount changes every single year. There is no state estate tax imposed in the state of California. Many states in the United States do impose a tax just because you pass away. Thankfully, California does not impose that tax. And then once your executor has done their due diligence of paying all your debts and paying all your bills, then they notify your beneficiaries that you've passed away. That opens and closes a statute of limitations in case if any beneficiary is going to contest your estate. And then they read the terms of the will to see who's inheriting the assets. They make the distributions to the beneficiaries and then the will is completed. Uh, and then if you have minor beneficiaries, another really important function of a will is that is the legal document where you would nominate legal guardians to raise your minor children, which hopefully is never needed. Uh, but that is a very important part of a will is the nomination of the people you know and trust that are like minded that would raise your minor children if heaven forbid something happened where you were no longer able to raise them. And then one really important thing to understand is when you have a will, having a will is not enough to keep your estate out of a court process called uh, probate. Probate is a process where uh, there's two things that take us into probate when you pass away. The purpose of probate is it is a judicially supervised process where assets are before our courts. And that is to make sure that your assets and debts and beneficiaries are all properly notified and dealt with, and that a judge is overseeing that court process before the assets are actually released from the court's jurisdiction and given to the executor to be distributed to the beneficiaries. Uh, one thing that takes us through the court process is if you have a will or even if you don't have a will, when you die in the state of California, if you own real property that's titled in your name, if it's not titled in a trust, then that's going to take us into probate. So that is part of why so many people in the state of California have trusts. It's not because they're special. It's not because they're wealthy. Just being a homeowner in the state of California, that is one very important reason to consider putting a trust in place. When you own real property and when that property is titled in a trust, having real property titled in a trust at the time of your death is how we protect that asset from going through that unnecessary public court process called probate. So that is one reason why people in the state of California put trusts in place is because they're homeowners. And then the other thing that will take us through that public uh, court process called probate is if you were to pass away and if you had an asset or assets titled in your individual name that didn't have a beneficiary attached to it, that when you add those assets together, if their total aggregate value exceeds $184,500, then that is another trigger that triggers probate. And the reason for that is anytime you have real property or assets in, ex in excess of $184,500, the state of California deems that that is worth the court's time in making sure that all of your assets and taxes have been properly dealt with and paid and that your beneficiaries have been officially notified to make sure that nobody's contesting the estate and that is when the state of California wants to take the court's time and have jurisdiction over those estates just to make sure that everything is properly dealt with. So it's important to understand that when you have a will, that is not enough to stay out of the probate court because if you own a house or if you have over $184,500 worth of assets that do not have living beneficiaries attached to them, that when you add those assets together and if their total aggregate value exceeds the $184,500, in those two situations, your estate will go through that court process. And then the question is, 
what's so bad with that court process? Why do so many people want to avoid that court process in the state of California? And the reason why people often choose to avoid that process is one, it is a public process. So anybody could go into the court and pull your file. Part of why you don't want your file to be made public is because everything about you, your assets and debts, your date of birth, social security number is made part of that public process. So oftentimes when a person dies and their estate goes through probate, the decedent's uh, identity is stolen. And now the executor has to deal with a stolen identity. And that just adds a whole unnecessary layer to an executor's job of dealing with identity fraud. Second, your loved ones, whether it's your minor children, adult children, or your beneficiaries in general, whether it's your best friends, siblings, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, charities, um, not so much charities, but your loved ones, their date of birth, social security number, um, and current address, all of that is also made part of the public record. And part of the reason why that is made part of the public record is because that is for the creditor's information, not so much to make their information public. But these are also very old rules and our laws evolve very slowly. So back when these laws were first made, identity fraud wasn't what it is, what it is. It wasn't then what it is today. And unfortunately, because these laws change very slowly, these are still the laws. So when a person passes away and their estate goes through probate, if you were to go down to the probate business office and pull any of the probate files, you'll be really surprised at how much private information is made part of that very public file. And then the other problem with probate is at a minimum by law, a probate has to remain open for a minimum period of time of six months. But oftentimes most probates stay open for a minimum of anywhere from eight to 12 months to as long as a year and a half. And they stay open for that long because the court's uh, calendar is very compacted because we only have three sitting probate judges for all of San Diego County. And San Diego County is a pretty big county and only having three probate judges who also hear conservatorship matters. They also have uh, guardianship matters in addition to their litigation calendar. They have a pretty full day in addition to hearing the probate matters as well. So it does take a long time to get through the court process in general, assuming that it's an uncontested probate matter. So if you have a contested probate matter, it's gonna take a lot longer than eight to 12 months to a year. Um, so probate is also a very slow process, but truly the worst thing about probate, honestly and truly, if you look at the back of that handout that was emailed to you, is the probate fees that are involved with probate. They're statutory, which is a very fancy word for they're predetermined by law. And what statutory means is it's a percentage calculation and it's based on the gross value of assets that are before the probate court. So for example, real property always triggers probate when it's not titled in a trust. So if you took a percentage calculation off the gross value of real property and then took that calculation to base the fee for a probate, that can be a lot of money when the whole court process is easily avoided just by putting the property into a trust. So it's kind of a sad situation when you really wrap your head around the fact that probate is totally unnecessary and avoidable. So thereby those fees are a waste of money really. And on average right now, most probate fees are averaging anywhere between 25 to as much as $50,000 on average, which is a lot of money if you think about it, in addition to the fact that it's a public process and a slow process to boot, and the fact that those monies are totally avoidable just by having that asset in the trust, and that's just monies that are wasted that could be given to your loved ones. And if you look at the cost of an estate plan, which on average, most estate plans right now can vary anywhere from $2,500 to $3,500 on average for an estate plan, and if you're you know, part of the ARAG legal insurance, which a lot of people at UCSD are, which is a fantastic program, um, ARAG, if you have full coverage, covers your estate plan. And if you have the insurance and if you have an estate plan, it covers the review and update of an estate plan. The only thing that ARAG really doesn't cover are notary fees and it doesn't fully cover 
deed fees. So you're really lucky at the university to have the legal insurance because it really makes estate planning attainable and quite affordable. So for those of you who have the insurance, if you haven't used it, I would really encourage you to use it. It's a great benefit. Um, we're part of ARAG. We like the insurance. It's super easy to work with. Um, and for those of you who've been meaning to use it, definitely now's the time. I would encourage you to use it. Uh, but the cost of putting an estate plan in place, if you consider the quid pro quo cost benefit analysis of $25 to $3,500 out of pocket versus a probate that can be anywhere from $25,000 to $50,000 and everything about your loved ones is part of that public record and the risk of your identity being stolen, to me, it's a no brainer. Uh, but oftentimes and understandably, people will put their estate plan on hold because most of us, you know, you spend your whole life working and it's a mortality thing and it's difficult to wrap your head around all the decisions that go into an estate plan. Because when you do an estate plan, you have to make a lot of decisions that are difficult. Like who would raise your minor children if heaven forbid you weren't here on this earth and couldn't raise your children and who would manage their monies, who would make your medical decisions if you couldn't make your own medical decisions and would you want to be on life support would you not want to be on life support do you want to be buried do you want to be cremated how old do you want your kids to be when they inherit all of this money do you want to give them monies over a period of time and stages to help them become responsible prudent financial managers do you want your married beneficiaries to keep these monies in a separate account so if they later get a divorce the monies that they inherited from you are protected. What if sadly one of your beneficiaries was having issues with illegal drugs? Would you give your trustee your permission to drug test a beneficiary? And if they tested positive for illegal drugs, would you allow your trustee to postpone that beneficiary's distribution, but use their monies to help pay for their rehab and help get them some support? There's just so many wonderful things and planning provisions that go into an estate plan, but you really have to approach it from that point of view. What a wonderful gift for you while you're alive to make these decisions that you get to choose your people that in your most vulnerable time of need, when you don't have capacity, when you're at your most vulnerable, wouldn't you want to pick the people that are managing your monies? Why have the courts pick those people? Because that's exactly what happens. If I walked out of my office, I'll say yesterday to not jinx anything. And if I got hit by a drunk driver, and if I didn't have any of my planning in place, even if I married and have a spouse, my husband does not have my legal permission to write checks on my behalf, to sign contracts on my behalf, without having a trust and a durable power of attorney that gives my financial powers to a third party when I lack capacity, if he needed to step into my shoes to make those decisions for me, the only way that he can legally do that, if I haven't taken the time to put my estate plan in place, giving him my legal permission to make those decisions on my behalf, he'd have to go through a different court process called a conservatorship. And that's the court process that would give him my permission to step into my shoes and manage my financial affairs when I'm incapacitated and can't make those decisions for myself. So, if you can approach an estate plan from that point of view, that it truly is a gift to make these decisions while you have capacity and while you have the ability to pick from the people in your circle, because let's be honest, not everybody in our circle is the best with money. So those are the people that you know that you're not going to put on your financial documents and maybe not all your financial people are the people that you'd want to be making your medical decisions. So how great that you get to decide who you'd want to be at your bedside being your medical advocate if you couldn't make your own medical decisions for yourself. And the other wonderful thing about an estate plan is it's revocable, which means it's changeable. So you get to revisit these documents because just like the Constitution of the United States, it's an elastic document life happens, things change. These documents are meant to be reviewed. They're meant to be updated. Your life will change. The people in your life will change. Relationships change. So you do want to come back. You want to revisit these documents. You want to revisit the, the decisions you made in these documents. And that is another wonderful benefit about these documents is as your life changes, as relationships evolve, 
Sometimes it's not in a good way, sadly. Sometimes your loved one's health is declining. Maybe the person that you wanted to be your trustee is now incapacitated and can no longer be your trustee. Maybe the person you wanted to be your trustee has admitted that they have a gambling problem and maybe you don't want the person with the gambling problem at the helm of your financial ship. All these things happen. I see it every day. This is my everyday normal. I had the wonderful privilege of being an estate planning attorney for 23 years. I've learned a lot from my clients. Uh, my clients don't even know how much they've taught me by being on this side of the desk. Um, so uh, my point is when you sit down and when you do an estate plan, it truly is a gift because you get to make these decisions while you have good health, while you have a clear mind. And Sadly, when you don't have the ability of having a clear mind and having a healthy body, you're so lucky that you took the time while you had those things, because now these documents protect you because the, po the whole point of having a trust and a durable power of attorney is those two documents work in tandem. That if you were to lose your capacity, you've named in those two documents, the people that you know and trust that can manage your financial assets during times of incapacity, because assets that you titled into the trust, which typically you put your house and you put your taxable assets into the trust. So all assets titled in the trust, your successor trustee has your legal permission during times of incapacity to manage for you. Or if you're elderly and your health is declining, you can always have your co-trustee have powers even while you have capacity. If you want the benefit of having help and a second set of eyes, which makes a lot of sense, and then the durable power of attorney is the other financial document that gives powers over all of your financial transactions that are outside of the trust, because some of your financial um, assets cannot legally be owned by anybody but you while you're alive. So while you're living, your retirement account is owned by you, your life insurance is owned by you. So if you were to walk out of your office yesterday and be hit by a drunk driver, it's the durable power of attorney that would give your loved ones the ability to talk to your life insurance company, to talk to your retirement company, to talk to your medical insurance, your life insurance, the car insurance, the homeowner's insurance, deal with all aspects of your financial life that has nothing to do with the trust. So the benefit of the trust and the durable power of attorney working together, if you were to be incapacitated, is invaluable because those two documents give you those protections because you pick the people that you know and trust during your time when you're the most vulnerable, when you're incapacitated, that the assets will be managed by the people you trust that are the most capable of managing those assets. And the other nice thing about these documents is when you nominate these individuals that you know and trust, you are just nominating them. So when the time comes that the first person that you listed is not able or willing to act, they do have the flexibility to decline that nomination, in which case we always nominate a second, third, and fourth person. So let's say the second person accepts the nomination, but then later down the road, maybe three years into your incapacity, they need to now step down because maybe their life is getting difficult and now managing your life and their life is too much. All of these documents have the flexibility of resignation built into them. So your successor trustee and durable power of attorney can always resign at any time for any reason because life does happen to all of us and it will. It happens to all of us. It's just a matter of knock on wood, when's it going to be our turn? So that is the beauty and the importance in these documents of naming a first, second, third, and fourth person. You want to have a couple of people nominated in these documents. Sometimes people come into my office with documents that they name each other if they're married and nobody else. And that just blows me away because I'm thinking, what is the point of having a document where you nominate your spouse only, but there's nobody else listed as a backup. So not only do you want a backup, you want to have at least a second, third, and fourth. If you're lucky, not everybody has three or four deep as a backup, but at a minimum, you want to have at least a second, a third. And if you're able to put four and five, that's fantastic. And when it comes to the financial documents, what happens is when each of us pass away, the powers and the durable power of attorney die with us. And that's when your will comes in. So the purpose of the will is when each of us die and because the powers of attorney and the powers in that document die with us,
the purpose of the will when you have a trust is we have a special kind of a will that's used with a trust called a pour over will. And what the pour over will says is when we die, if there's an asset that's titled in our individual name that doesn't have a beneficiary attached to it, and as long as the total aggregate value of all of those assets is under $184,500, which means there's no probate, then the pour over will says that those assets will pour over into the trust. And usually those assets are the cars, the RVs, motorcycles, and now electric bikes. Because when you create an estate plan, your attorney is gonna prepare a document called an assignment of tangible personal property. And what that document does is it assigns all of the household belongings and it assigns all those documents into the trust. So that when you pass away, the household furniture, jewelry, artwork, all of that is already deemed part of your trust. So none of those assets are included in the $184,500. And most of us don't put our cars into the trust because the trust is revocable, it doesn't offer any creditor protection. It's like a pass-through entity. So because it's a pass-through entity, when you put assets into the trust, there is no additional creditor protection. So because of that, when you put the house into the trust, you still want to have really good homeowner's insurance. You still want to have a really good solid umbrella insurance, because if sadly, if a contractor were to get injured while working on your home, having that house in the trust does not give that home any additional creditor protection. So because of that, you need to have everything that's titled in the trust still insured. If you have a bank account, you want to make sure you've got that FDIC insurance on that. But for all of those reasons, because our cars, well, at least mine, it's not worth a lot of money. So because of that, I know that if you took the value of my car and my husband's car and now my daughter's car, if you added those cars together, they're well under the $184,500. And because the trust doesn't offer us any additional protection from creditors, our vehicles are just in our name. So if my husband and I were to both die simultaneously, um, our pour over will would have those vehicles pour over into the trust. And our trust says that those vehicles would go equally to our two kids. So that's really the function of a pour over will when you have a trust. It's basically to say if you have an asset that doesn't have a beneficiary tied to it, those assets by default are now going to go into the trust. But the nuance is, is sometimes, sadly, when people have a trust, they can still have a probate. And usually how that happens is when they go and do an estate plan, their attorney will put their house into the trust. And then later on, the interest rates will fall like they recently did. And smart people, most people will take advantage of these low interest rates as they should. And then unbeknownst to them, sadly, not their fault. The house will come out of the trust as part of the refi process, but they don't know that the house is now outside of the trust. So sadly, when you have a trust, that doesn't keep you out of probate because when you die, it's how your assets are titled at the time of your death that determines whether or not we're going through probate. So once you create an estate plan, that's really step one and a two step and, a, and the second step is the ongoing step that never ends keeping your eye on how your assets are titled is something that you as the client always has to be mindful of because when you create an estate plan you always want to make sure that you're updating the documents about every eight to ten years because the language in the documents does become stale for lack of a better word because the tax laws do change and they tend to change with every new president so eight to ten years is really about the longest that you want to go before you update the estate planning language you could probably go about 15 years at the very longest, but eight to 10 years is about how long you want to go. Um, and for those of you that have ARAG, you could even update your estate plan earlier and more often because your legal insurance makes it a lot easier to do that. But from a legal point of view, from an updating the language point of view, eight to 10 years is about the norm. If you want to change anything that the estate plan says, trustees, beneficiaries, medical decision makers, uh, life support decisions, cremation, burial decisions, you could update those types of decisions whenever and however often you would like. But from a legal point of view, eight to 10 years is the norm. 15 is as long as you want to go. Never let it go more than that. Um, but having said that, 
when you have these documents, it is important to keep an eye on how your assets are titled, because if your house came out of the trust and then sadly you passed away, even if your trust is current and up to date, if the house is not titled in the trust, that will trigger probate. And then what happens is, is when the house goes through probate, the pour over will is what's introduced into probate and the pour over will tells the judge that you have a trust. And after the house goes through that whole long expensive probate process, and after your beneficiaries sadly lose anywhere from $25,000 to $50,000 in unnecessary lawyers and court fees, then the house will ultimately be titled into the name of the trust because that's what the pour over will does. And then the house will go into the trust at the close of the probate and ultimately that asset will be given to the beneficiaries of the trust. The nice thing about the pour over will though is because you have a trust and because the trust is a legally confidential document, the pour over will keeps most things about your loved ones private. So that is one other benefit of having a trust versus not having a trust is unlike a testamentary will that when it's introduced into probate, everything about everybody is part of that public uh, process. But when you have a pour over will because it defers to a trust and because the trust is a legally confidential document, the pour over will keeps most everything about everybody legally confidential. So it's really nice to have the pour over will instead of the testamentary trust. But that is one big nuance in the law between the pour over will and just a good old fashioned trust. So we talk now about your durable power of attorney and how it works with the trust. And now we should talk a little bit about a trust because probably the most commonly asked question I get, which is a really good question, is what's the difference between a trust and a will? And really the biggest difference between the trust and a will is when you have a will, you're gonna go through probate if you own a house. And when you have a will, if you have assets that exceed $184,500 that don't have a pay on death beneficiary living and attached to them, you're gonna go through probate. And if you have beneficiaries that are under the age of 18, when you have a will, you're going to go through probate. But when you have a trust, and as long as your house is titled in the trust, we're not going through probate. And when you have a trust, regardless of how much financial monies you have, whether it's a dollar or $3 million, as long as those assets are titled in the name of the trust or name the trust as the pay on death beneficiary, we're not going through probate. And to me, one of the biggest benefits of a trust versus a will is when you have a will, you cannot put any contingencies in a will, not one, because the courts, with all due respect, they don't have the time. The courts don't oversee any contingencies in a will. Whereas when you have a trust, you have a person called a successor trustee. One of the benefits of naming a successor trustee is they will legally enforce all of the provisions within the terms of the trust. And because of that, you can put any contingency in a trust, as long as they're not against public policy. So one question a lot of clients will ask me, which unfortunately I can't do because it's against public policy, is a lot of my clients want me to put language in their trust that prohibits their surviving spouse from getting remarried. Well, I can't do that. And then other clients will ask me if I can put language in their trust that requires their surviving spouse to do a prenup if they get remarried. I can't do that either because that's also against public policy. But what I can do is I can encourage your kid, I can require your kids to put their inheritance into a separate property trust so that if your kids later get remarried, we can protect their inheritance from a potential future divorce, which also protects the inheritance if your child's spouse were to have an accident or file bankruptcy or have any kind of creditor's claim. I can also protect your beneficiaries if they have substance abuse issues by giving your trustee your permission to drug test a beneficiary and to postpone a distribution to that beneficiary. I can also protect your animals by giving your trustee your permission to place your animals with your family, friends, or with your adult children or your minor children's legal guardian, uh, or to place them with a no-kill animal shelter. I can also make sure that your trustee gives gifts to charities in your name if you're a philanthropic person. Uh, but basically the point is, is with a trust, I can put contingencies in place without a trust, none. When you have little kids, I can put all kinds of contingencies in place for little kids. We can have your trustee acknowledge the educational milestones of high school, college, and advanced degree gift uh, graduation. We could have the trustee giving wedding gifts for your children. We could have your trustee helping your children get into a, a house by helping them with a down payment, assuming that your child could qualify to purchase the house based on your child's 
credit history so that that way they're actually buying a house that they can afford and not buying a house just because they're, you know, we're receiving this trust fund or we can write that however you want because houses are very expensive now. So sometimes we can play with those provisions because it is nice to help people get into that first property because it is getting harder and harder to get into the real estate market. My point being, no matter who your beneficiary is, whether it's a child, a niece, a nephew, a best friend, a neighbor, somebody who I just had a client in here yesterday who's giving her estate to this lady who was homeless that she's taken in, who she has no legal relationship to, but that's her beneficiary who talk about amazing people that walk the earth. They're here, but you can have your estate plan be written in a trust with any contingency that makes sense to you in your specific situation, just so long as it's not against public policy. Um, so when it comes to distributions, most oftentimes we'll do distributions by ages. So oftentimes we'll do more than one distribution because statistically, if you do one distribution, it's, it's spent within a two year period. That's the current statistic. So oftentimes we like to do at least two distributions. So st statistically, if you do that first distribution intentionally small, if they aren't gonna be so financially astute with that first distribution, we'll make it small five to 10, 15%. So if they spend that first distribution, not so wisely, it's a little bit of the money, not all the money. And then maybe a year or two later, you give the final distribution so that when they receive it, it's invested and held on. And it's, it's statistically gonna be kept and managed a lot longer than if you just give one distribution. But that's the beauty of a trust. You can give multiple distributions, whereas if all you have is a will, you can only give one distribution in a will. And with a will, you don't get to pick the age. It all is distributed outright. You don't have the ability of choosing an age with a distribution, but in a trust, you get to choose all of that. So I had a client once from UCSD who shall remain nameless, who felt so strongly about education that he or she or they said that their beneficiary would get the monies when they obtained a PhD or turned 70, whichever occurred first. And that's how they wrote their trust. So uh, I had another client who had tortoises and did what's called an honorary trust and kept a share of their estate in trust because tortoises live over a hundred years and they wanted to make sure that these animals weren't euthanized absent a medical reason. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can do with a trust and that's where having an attorney and writing a trust is very important because it's the planning that's important. It's not a one size fits all. But there's a lot of family dynamic that comes into an estate plan and your estate plan should reflect your family dynamic, what's important to you. And that's where having these conversations and planning accordingly becomes very important. So for those of you who have an existing estate plan, one change in the law that is very important to know is 15, 10 years ago, all of us estate planning attorneys, when it came to your 403B and your retirement accounts, we used to advise you to name your spouse as your primary beneficiary and to name your trust as your second. Those laws have changed. So now when it comes to your retirement assets, including your 403Bs, you do not want to name your trust as a beneficiary because now if your trust is a beneficiary on any retirement account, including your 403B, it will trigger an unnecessary tax that can trigger as much as an 35% unnecessary tax. So I would encourage all of you, preferably when we're done with this presentation, please log on to your retirement accounts. And if your trust is a listed beneficiary, please change that unless there's a reason to have your trust listed. Oftentimes, the only reason it would make sense to have a trust listed as a beneficiary is if you have a loved one who needs to have their monies go through a special needs trust because they're on state or federal disability. Otherwise, if you don't have that situation, then your best beneficiaries on your retirement and your uh, 403B is to have people and or charities by name. So if you have children, your best beneficiary designation is spouse first, kids second, grandkids third. If you don't have grandchildren yet, name a third beneficiary, whether it's your parents or your siblings or your nieces and nephews. You always want to have three beneficiaries deep. If you can't name a third, oftentimes if you reach out to the retirement institution and ask them if you can name a third, they'll allow a third, but you just have to ask. 
The reason I encourage a third beneficiary is most of you probably have well over $184,500 just tied up in your retirement monies. So if heaven forbid you, your spouse and your secondary beneficiary were all in the same car and passed away, then we might have a probate happening just for that one asset. So that is the value of having that third beneficiary listed. So um, I would definitely encourage you after this presentation, if you have just a couple of minutes to check your uh, beneficiaries and ensure that you do not have your trust listed because that was okay 10, 15 years ago and earlier, but it's not okay now because those laws did change. And then if any of you took advantage of the refinance laws that just recently happened, if you are concerned about whether or not your house is still titled in your trust, as long as your house is here in the state of California, if you wanna email me your house address, I'd be happy to check title of your house. It's free to me, so it's free to you. Um, I'm putting my email address on the chat. So if you wanna send me your address, I'd be happy to check your deed. I'll just email it over to you. I can tell you whether or not your house made it back into your trust. Um, the reason why that's so important is if you refinance and if the house was not put back into the trust after the refinance, then that would trigger a probate should you pass away. And oftentimes when people refinance, they don't even realize that the house wasn't put back into the trust. And that's really, really important. And for those of you who have an estate plan, Oftentimes people will go in, they'll do the estate plan, their estate planning attorney will put their house into the trust, and then the estate planning attorney should give you what we call homework, which is the advice as to how all of your other assets should be titled, and for whatever reason, probably, I hate to say, but probably 50% of people do the homework and 50% don't, so if you're the 50% that hasn't or didn't, I would encourage you now to do it. So if you didn't get around to doing it, when it comes to your retirement assets or any annuity assets, you want to make sure that you don't name the trust on those assets, and that's for tax reasons. So retirement and annuity assets, you should name people as beneficiaries or charities, not the trust. So you always want a primary, secondary, and preferably a third beneficiaries on those types of assets. Any other asset, um, taxable assets, bank accounts, checking accounts, savings accounts, investment accounts, money market accounts, those types of assets should either be titled in the trust or they should name the trust as the pay on death beneficiary because that's how those assets avoid probate when you pass away. If you have life insurance, I do want the trust as the pay on death beneficiary. You can go ahead and name your spouse as a secondary, name the kids as a third or name some other person fourth or however you want, but always have the trust as the primary. The reason I like the trust as the primary beneficiary is because that's going to force uh, the trustee to put that large check into a trust account because usually the life insurance check is over $184,500. So you want to put that into a trust account to protect that from triggering a probate. And if any of you have timeshares, you want your timeshare interest to be titled to the name of the trust. And the way that you do that is you call the timeshare company directly because most of them do their deeds internally. And you'll ask them just to retitle your timeshare interest so it's titled into the name of your trust. And if any of you have rental properties, you want your rental properties either titled in the name of the trust or if you have an LLC, you should have something called an operating agreement. And in the operating agreement is something called a member, uh, a member interest. That's your ownership interest. And you want that title to you as trustee of your trust. If you own a S Corp or a C Corp, you want your stock certificate interest titled to you as trustee of your trust. And that's how those interests avoid going through probate. If you have assets elsewhere in the United States, you can put assets outside of the state of California into this California trust. So if you're lucky to have a house in Hawaii, that house in Hawaii can be titled in this California trust. The only thing that can't be titled in a California trust are assets located outside of the United States. So the United States does not have jurisdiction outside of its borders. So for my clients who are lucky to have assets outside of the US, 
you have to deal with those assets outside of the U.S. in the other country. So, for example, if you had cash and or real property in Canada, you'd want to have a separate estate plan in Canada to deal with those assets located there because the U.S. has no jurisdiction outside of its borders. So an estate plan in California can't try to have any jurisdiction over assets outside of its borders. But an estate plan in California could have a house in Hawaii titled into a California trust, and that's okay. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about today. I do 